Hey folks, glad to have you all here this morning. On this 11th day of April, Let's see what we got for announcements here. Well, we have our annual conference coming up in May. Just a note. Jean Tusco has remembered loved ones. That should have been in the list of Easter memorials last week, but I neglected to put it in. And so, well, let me tell you a little bit about Jean Tusco. Oh, no. <laughs> 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 she didn't tell me. That was Audrey brought to my attention <laughs> that I had uh, failed to put that in. And I thought, oh, gee, I can't believe it. I looked at the paper. I sure did. It was my fault. And I said to Jean, how, you know, I'm so sorry I did that. And she said, oh, Rev, please. Don't worry about that. Nothing. Don't worry. I'll make sure it gets in next week. Oh, please, don't worry about that. <laughs> I, I understand. Who wouldn't, you know, we all make mistakes, right? That's a gracious person, Jean Tusco. And uh, it's really nice when you run into gracious people in this world, isn't it? And we got the very best right here in this house, right here, right now. Uh, let's take a look here at our prayer list. We've got John and Kayla. That is Barb's uh, grandson and girlfriend, and uh, they're getting over there. It was a big fire last week, and so uh, keep them in your prayers. Chums uh, for Bible Church, Ryan Reevely Church of the Week, Paul and Linda, <coughs> Paul Lewis and Linda McRae. They're our missionaries of the week. They're retired. Okay, but we'll continue to pray for them. And Evelyn Totero is their senior of the week. Anybody else this evening or this morning have a prayer request we ought to have in our bulletin? Yeah. Surely. Uh, we need some family mercy prayers for Zach and my grandson Cody. They're going to be driving home from the state of Washington this week coming up. <coughs> Flying or driving? Well, he's flying out to Washington, and they're going to get the U-Haul and come home because Cody is out of the Navy and oh. get a medical discharge. Okay. Yeah, we heard at the district conference about uh, the, telling us about missionaries, and uh, once again, you know, <coughs> not everybody lives in America, and if you don't, everybody doesn't handle things the way we do, or <coughs> we don't realize really how blessed we are here. We really are. Uh, there's other parts of the world that there's. We think we'd like to go back in the day, but uh, the living conditions across the globe are not necessarily nice. So missionaries have it, uh, a difficult time, and uh, I was proud, yes I use the word proud, of our church that we continue to sponsor our missionaries, <coughs> support them, and get them what we pledge to give them. Uh, that's a great thing. Anybody else? All right, tell you what. 
Dan Markey's going to sing for us. We're going to sing hymn number 72 first. Have a reading, prayer. Let's have a church service while we're here. Let's do it. 72. <coughs> Standing as we sing.
we really have so much to thank you for. There is so much that we just take for granted. We are blessed every single day, every hour, our entire lives. Father, there are people that are born into this world into shameful circumstances. People are born into this world to be abused, to be pushed around, forced into corners, beaten down, humiliated. People are born into this world with crippling diseases and sicknesses. And we are healthy and whole. And we live in a wonderful place. We have homes that have heat in winter, and they're air conditioned in the summer. We've got more changes of clothes than we can imagine. And nice bedding, and carpeted floors, and we eat well. Our Heavenly Father, thank you for all these things. We are peculiarly blessed in this country. We didn't choose this great blessing, but it's something that you've given to us, and for it, we're just thankful. We ask you to help us to live worthy lives, Lord. Live in appreciation of what you've given us. Help us to really understand who we are and accept who we are, and then live the life that you have given us, that we might be shining lights for those around us, for our own benefit as well as theirs. Our Heavenly Father, we pray that you pour out your Holy Spirit upon us, that he might speak to our hearts and guide us in the proper and right way that we should go. And teach us the way to live before you and before each other. Our Heavenly Father, we have names on our prayer list here today. And we would think again of uh, John and Kayla as they continue to adjust to this uh, calamity last week's fire. We ask you to put your hand upon them and help them, guide them, watch over them. We pray for Kayla that you keep her healthy and strong with that baby. We ask you to watch over each and every one. And for the other fires we hear took place this week, Lord, we pray for these people who in many cases weren't as fortunate. We pray for them and their families and those that have been lost. We also pray today, Lord, for those who need physical healing. We ask you to put your hand upon each and every one who is undergoing difficulty and hardship, we pray that you restore folk to health. We pray for guidance and wisdom and direction and understanding, that we might make good and wise choices every day, really take a good and honest look at the situations around us, a really honest look at ourselves, and live the life that we should. We'll be uh, very thankful for that, Lord. We pray for our missionary friends, as we were reminded this week, and again, these people have taken up the cross and gone to far-flung places. We appreciate what they do. We thank you for the privilege of being a part of their work. We pray that you continue to encourage them and watch over them, protect them, keep them safe. We pray that they might have great results for their mission. In some cases, these people are laying foundations that fruit is not going to be seen maybe for decades. As we've seen in the past, things like that happen. Well, we ask you to bless each and every one anywhere along the way where they go. Take care of them. We pray, our Heavenly Father, for uh, the Chelmsford Bible Church up there in Massachusetts and our friend Ryan Reevely. We ask your blessing upon them that that might be a great lighthouse in that community. We pray for Paul and Linda, uh, served in the mission field for many, many years. We pray that they might now enjoy their retirement, that they might have a measure of health and comfort and strength. We thank you for their work and we ask your blessing upon them. We pray tonight or this morning for Evelyn Totero. We ask you to watch over her and take care of her today and every day. We pray for all our seniors, Lord, that you might truly compensate for the loss of physical abilities and the different things that just kind of drift away. We ask your blessing on our seniors. We pray for the United States Armed Forces. We pray for law enforcement agents. We pray for national leaders and all those who truly seek to do your will here in this world. We ask your blessing on each and every one. Father, would you please hear all our prayers? 
Would you please hear the cry of our heart? We join our voices together and say, Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, and thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Now we have special music from Dan Markey. I'll share something with everyone. Um, back in, I think, early February, uh, Sue asked me if I would sing after Easter, and I said, sure. And uh, <coughs> since then, I've been racking my brain as to what I was going to sing. Because, you know, I, I know three songs, and I don't sing them very well at all. So uh, <laughs> uh, fast forward to two weeks ago. Um, Palm Sunday after the service, you guys were, uh, the members were voting uh, Reverend back in, and I was in the back uh, having a casual conversation with, with Reverend Beth, and I, I, I think I, uh, I joked and said, hey, it was nice to get to know you and everything, and, uh, <laughs> um, but anyway, we, we just had like a, a casual three-minute conversation, and uh, still at that time, I didn't know what I was going to sing two weeks later at church. And uh, it's something that I, I take, you know, to heart. It's, it's very important to me. Um, and uh, just in, in that conversation, I, I felt God speaking to me um, through Rev and through Beth. And, um, you know, I, I didn't even know the song at, at the time. So uh, I just learned it. <laughs> um, but it, it, was, uh, it was inspired through our conversation. So... Uh, I just want everyone to know that if you don't think that uh, God can show up during casual encounters, Amen. He can, absolutely. Amen. Sometimes on this journey, I get lost in my mistakes. What looks to me like weakness is a canvas for your strength. And my story isn't over, my story's just begun. And failure won't define me, cause that's what my father does. Yeah, failure won't define me, cause that's what my father does. Ooh. Lay your burdens down, ooh, here in the Father's house. Check your shame at the door, cause it ain't welcome anymore. Ooh, you're in the Father's house. Uh oh. Arrival's not the end game, the journey's where you are. You never wanted perfect, you just wanted my heart. And the story isn't over, if the story isn't good. And failure's never final when the Father's in the room. Failure's never final when the Father's in the room. Ooh. come home, the helpless find hope, and love is on the move when the Father's in the room. Prison doors fling wide, the dead come to life, and 
Love is on the move when the father's in the room. Miracles take place, the cynical find faith. Love is breaking through when the father's in the room. Jericho walls are quaking, strongholds now are shaking. Love is breaking through when the father's in the room. Love is breaking through when the father's in the room. Ooh, lay your burdens down. Ooh, here in the father's house, check your shame at the door, cause it ain't welcome anymore. Ooh, thing in the world. Thanks, Dan. That was beautiful, number one. Before I get started, tomorrow is April 12th, and there was one time when I forgot Beth's birthday. <laughs> Very early in our marriage, maybe not even in our marriage. But you're only allowed one. And if you forget more than once, you are a fool. But I would like to say this. When I first saw her, I was in the Father's house at the Johnson City Primitive Methodist Church. I was the janitor. They were having a prayer meeting. I saw her from the back. I thought, wow, she's really good looking. I'm surprised I never noticed her before. She is better looking now, 62 uh, years, and you're just beautiful. And she's the best wife I could have ever had. I am so thankful that you're my wife. And uh, that's what I have to say. Amen. Amen. Happy birthday. Happy birthday, God. I called Jean Tusco this morning about uh, Beth's, you know, she got that Facebook page there, and there's pictures of the Smiths. Remember Reverend Ken and Mary Smith, and there's a picture of their family, and I was really close. They, they treated me like I was one of theirs when I was down in Allentown. And, uh, and then I was talking to Gene this morning, and I'm telling you what. Since I got saved and started mixing with the primitive Methodists, just had the privilege of meeting the best people on the planet Earth. And they're right in this room, every last one of you. I love you people. I'm so glad that uh, God brought me here. It's just been great. Now, let us take our bulletins. And I'm going to read the back of, or the uh, inside, left hand side. It says, When the day of Pentecost came. Keep this in context, that's just so important. Scripture, as powerful as it is, you can pick out uh, a verse here and a verse there, and it is uh, what they call kind of an aphorism. You know, a really short saying that's pithy and uh, wonderfully uh, worded. But when you put those things in context, they speak to our lives. They speak about who we are and our situation that we're in here right now. 
the apostles had just gone through this tremendous confusion in their lives. They walked with Jesus and saw him do the most unbelievable things. And right down to the time when they arrested him, they thought for sure, Jesus, I mean, he is sight to the blind. He speaks to the lame and they walk. He gives life to the dead. They can't do anything to him. They're not going to lay a glove on him. He keeps saying he's going to be arrested. He's going to be uh, tried and all the rest of it. Oh, when they come to get him, <coughs> he's going to blow them away and he's going to take his eternal throne. And this is what's on the horizon. And lo and behold, <coughs> they came and arrested Jesus and hauled him off and beat him viciously, mercilessly, <coughs> And ultimately they crucified him. And the apostles just had to be... Gully want is a word that comes to my mind. Is what in the world has just taken place? And they're going to say in our passage, we thought that he was going to restore Israel to its glory. And yet here this whole thing has just collapsed before our eyes. All through our lives, we prayed for things. We've hoped for things. We've longed for things. We felt inspired and hopeful and enthusiastic only to watch something happen or something fall apart. The wheels fall off and it doesn't work out again. And the apostles are here watching the wheels fall off and all their hopes and dreams just dash once again. You know the feeling? You just feel like you're born to lose, some people say. That's why we got, <laughs> listen to the songs that are on the radio. Talk about, talking about who we are, we're born to lose, and all the rest of it. And the third day, they encountered him in his resurrection. And again, they were just flabbergasted. They really didn't know what to make of this. And then he is with them for 40 days and he leaves and he goes to be with his father. And when he goes to be with his father, he says, hey, stay here in the city until you get power from on high. And he is speaking of the Holy Spirit. And I don't think they really understood what that was all about. Uh, we find Peter talking about the Holy Spirit when they're trying to uh, figure out who's going to take Judas's place and they have a man named Matthias and uh, Peter says how the Holy Spirit inspired these scriptures and it's just not clear what's going to happen. You know, like us, we know the Lord's coming again. We've heard it our whole lives. And I remember Bill Vasey at conference just a couple of years ago talking about his father. Bill Vasey's big as I am. He's a big individual. He called his father Daddy. And he said when his father died, <clears throat> he said, Daddy, you told me that Christ was going to come before you died. He said, I know. What do I know? And we don't know when he's going to come. But he's going to come. In a day and an hour when you don't expect it. And the apostles, they were told to wait in the city until you get from power from on high. Not knowing what to expect. Let's read our passage. When the day of Pentecost came, that's 50 days, or 49 days, however it worked out, after his resurrection. Okay? He was with them 40 days, and Penta, 5, 50 days. That's two months after his resurrection. Long time it seems. They were all together in one place and suddenly a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven, filled the whole house where they were sitting. And they saw what seemed to be the tongues of fire. They separated and came to rest on each of them. Now just think, they're, they're, they're together 
I don't know, reading scripture, praying, whatever they're doing in their little public worship, and they weren't, they were in an upper room in a house. But we understand that uh, most people lived in a house that was four or five stories high. And your part of the house was probably something like 20 by 10. A 20 by 10. So that's a 10 foot and 20 feet. That's probably like your bedroom. And that's all it really was. They slept in these rooms and they stored things in these rooms. But you didn't just hang out in your living room all day. You didn't have a variety of rooms. So they gathered together in prayer. And all of a sudden, as they're sitting there in prayer, like they've been doing for 10 days since Jesus ascended to be with the Father. And all of a sudden, these tongues of fire come down and rest on Ed Reeves and Paul. And, and a tongue of fire comes and rests on your head. And we're watching all around. And it's happening to us. <clears throat> they seem like tongues of fire. They separated and came to rest on each of them. And all of them were filled with the Holy Spirit. And they began to speak in other tongues. So Spirit enabled them. So, I'm sorry, what's your first name? What is it? Ryan. Ryan. All of a sudden, Ryan starts speaking Portuguese. Right? <laughs> he starts speaking in Portuguese. And Paul over here cuts loose with some Spanish. And Debbie over here starts speaking Italian. <clears throat> And Ed starts speaking Mandarin Chinese, and on it goes. And people around are hearing these things, and they're understanding. They're thinking, hey, I, I, I'm from Portugal. I just came to town for this celebration, and nobody speaks my language here but my family that's with me. And all of a sudden, I'm hearing the great acts of God spoken in my own language. It says here, they were staying in Jerusalem. God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. And each one heard in their own language being spoken the great acts of God. And amazed and perplexed, they said to one another, What does this mean? And some, however, they made fun. These guys are drunk. <coughs> Listen to them babble. And it goes on. Peter stood up with the eleven. He raised his voice. You know, this is the same Peter who denied Jesus three times who said, I don't care if the rest of the... Jesus, can we just be frank? These guys, they mean well, but you know they're... They're not me. Jesus, you know you can count on me. Among all of them. And Jesus said, really? Well, Peter, and he looked him right in the eye and said, before this evening is over, you're going to deny me three times. And don't you know, before the night was over, do you get what I'm saying? The Apostle Peter said, I don't know that man. <clears throat> I'm telling you, I don't know who he is. And then, God, you know what him. I don't know who that guy is. Three times. And the last time, at the bidding of a some young girl, Jesus, as he was led off to his trial, looked over and saw Peter. And again, their eyes. Imagine the talk about shame and humiliation. You all know what I'm talking about? You ever been humiliated? You ever been shamed? You ever been embarrassed? You ever felt like, I wish I could crawl away because that's all I am. That Peter, after Jesus' resurrection, he told the women, go and tell the apostles that I'm risen. And go and tell Peter. Make sure he knows. And then when Jesus was in Peter's presence, he says, Peter, do you love me? Lord, you know I do. Peter, do you really love me? Yes, Lord, I do. Peter, do you love me? And the shame washed over Peter. The embarrassment at his failure. And Jesus looked him in the eye again and said, Peter... You feed my sheep. You are my friend. And I'll never leave you nor forsake you even unto the end of the earth, Peter. I love you. I know what you did. I know all about it. But I don't care. Because love conquers all of that. 
Love overlooks all those things. Well, now Peter stands up. And he's been filled with the Spirit of God. With the eleven, he raised his voice, he addressed the crowd. These people aren't drunk, as you think. No, it's nine in the morning. No, this is what was spoken of by the prophet Joel. In the last days, God says, I will pour out my Spirit on all people. I will not just pour out my Spirit on teachers, not just on prophets, not just on kings, not on people specially gifted to make temple uh, utensils. My Spirit will be poured out on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters will prophesy. <clears throat> your sons and your daughters will speak the very words of God. Young men are going to see visions. Old men are going to dream dreams. And even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my Spirit in those days and they will prophesy. I'll show wonders in the heavens above and signs on the earth below. Blood and fire and billows of smoke. The sun will be turned into darkness. The moon will turn to blood before the coming of the great and glorious day of the Lord. And everyone, not some, everyone, not a few, everyone, not most, everyone, not all but everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. I believe everyone in this room has called on the name of the Lord our God as Savior. And everyone in this room is therefore saved. Everyone. How could you say that, Rev? You don't know everybody's heart. I'm reading the Bible. That's what I'm going by. And God said, if you call upon the name of the Lord, and I know everyone here has, you are saved. Fellow Israelites, Peter says, listen to this. Jesus of Nazareth was a man accredited by God to you by miracles. How did we know Jesus was the Christ? The miracles. Wonders and signs which God did among you through him. You all know it yourselves. This man was handed over to you by God's deliberate plan and foreknowledge. I'm thinking of the word comprehensive. You ever write an essay in school? Yeah. And did the teacher ever say, this is really good, you need to go farther? Really? I thought I was going to but Maybe other people felt the same. This is really good. Now the next time, well, God's plan goes farther. It's what they call comprehensive. This is really good. I remember I preached in Allentown one night, and I was preaching about, Smith almost never, Smith, Smith almost never let me preach, right? And uh, but he did that night. And did I preach on signs and wonders? I think. And I went through a list of signs and talked about them. But I didn't include the resurrection in the list of signs, the ultimate sign, right? And then Reverend Smith stands up and he says, "That was really good." And and it really was. <laughs> but it just wasn't comprehensive enough. God's plan is what we call comprehensive. It takes in the whole totality. Everything is included. Nothing's left out. Your eternal destiny is all worked out, all figured out. That's why the Apostle Paul wrote to churches and he said, you know what? He wrote to the Philippians and he said, he who began a good work in you, he'll see it through to the end. He'll see it through all the way because it's comprehensive. There's no mistakes. There's no left outs. There's no, 
Ah, I forgot to put the oil in those lamp in these candles here. They're going to burn half the service. They're going to start smoking. Joyce is going to see the smoke and say, "Well, you forgot to put the lamp oil in those candles." Well, God doesn't forget the oil. It's comprehensive. It says here. God did among them, as you yourselves know, this man was handed over to you by God's deliberate plan. Deliberate. My mother used to say, use that word. She said, Alan, you did that deliberately. Deliberately. You thought about it. You intended to do it. And you did it. It wasn't a mistake. You didn't stumble into this. You knew what you were doing, and you did it intentionally. God did all of this deliberately. Oh, is that what everybody's looking at? That stupid fly up there? Wash, wash, wash not whatever. fly. It was, it was in here last week, too. I saw Mary Beth earlier. Okay, everybody, there's a wasp up there. Get a good look. Now forget about it. He's got a deliberate plan. It's intentional. It's purposeful. It's not a mistake. Jesus didn't come into the world and they arrested him and crucified him and God was caught off guard. Oh, I didn't see this coming. No, he knew exactly how we, we would behave. He knows how people are. He knows the human heart. He knows that it's real easy for us to look at those guys down in Washington and say, you know, they're all ridiculous. And they got all these women on the side and they're doing this and they're doing that. No, that would never be me if I was down there. We don't have a clue what the temptations are like, right? It's easy to sit here and say all that. <clears throat> this is a deliberate plan with foreknowledge. He knows how weak we can be. He knows how poorly we respond under real temptation when we've been swollen with pride and with arrogance and with people surrounding us telling us how important we are, how great we are. The news media runs to our face with a microphone. What do you think? And they come to us. Well, we don't know anything about that. We don't have a clue. We just live it up here in where? Hot Bottom, German, Brooklyn, Mayfield. We're made of the same stuff as those disaster areas are. Well, there's a deliberate plan and foreknowledge. He knows who we are. He knows our sinfulness. He knows our weakness. He knows he knows how peer pressure affects us. How we think about what other people are thinking about us. And how are we going to respond to that? Are we going to respond by what? Being a dramatic person and making a big show so we'll get noticed. Because we want to be noticed. Or do we respond by receding to the back and just letting things pass by and hoping nobody notices because we don't want to be in the spotlight or somewhere in between. He knows about all that. He knows who we are. He knows how we react when people offend us. And Jesus told us, you know, it's really easy to forgive the people who love you. It's really easy to be kind to the people who are good, kind to you. But what should set you apart is that you're kind and good to the people who aren't kind and good to you. That's how your Heavenly Father is. He knows who you are. He knows your capacities, he knows your capabilities, he knows your strengths, and he knows your failures, and he still has a comprehensive plan to make sure that you go to heaven with him and that you have the Spirit of God in your life to transform you from within into what you need to be. Deliberate foreknowledge. And you, now Peter's not running for cover. Now Peter's not hiding behind a flaming barrel. Now Peter's not afraid that somebody was noticed, but he looks at them and he said, you, with the help of wicked men, you put him to death. You nailed him to the cross. 
but God raised him up. God raised him from the dead, freeing him from the agony of death. Because it was impossible for death to keep its hold on him. You don't kill eternity. You don't kill God. You kill the things that are not in this world. You don't kill the things that are eternal and invisible. This week, thinking about it, on our evening campfire, if we're not connected with God, we have no life. We're a battery. When I was a kid, batteries, were ever any nine live batteries, remember them, the cat? Little silver battery, and that red cat, I think, was on there. And those batteries were ever ready. And they were good for 20 minutes. They weren't ever ready, really. They were very weak. And if you had a flashlight, you better get your flashing done within 20 minutes. That thing was going to get so dim, it was no good. And then they came out with alkaline batteries that last so much longer. and have so much more power. And they're so much more reliable. First they had, remember, rechargeables? Where's your battery recharger? It's in a drawer somewhere, isn't it? Yeah, the battery chargers. Never need to buy a battery again. Those batteries, the more you charge them, the weaker they got. And finally you said, this isn't even worth it. And now we just buy a pack of 20 batteries at once, right? Yeah. We're living in high cotton, because when I was a kid, if the batteries ran out on Christmas morning and there were four D batteries in a toy, you weren't getting four more D batteries for some time. <laughs> so you walked around, you used your battery operated toy as a manual toy. But now, those batteries, but they will wear out. And they will die. Everything in this planet Earth gets its sustenance somehow from the Earth, right? Grass gets its nutrition from the chemicals and the organic matter and water and all the things that are in the soil. And everything gets us the trees, right? The food we eat. And what's the earth connected to? It's just floating in space, isn't it? There's no umbilical cord. There's nothing connected. The sun's going to wear out. It's a great big battery. It's going to wear out. Not in our life. When I was a kid in school, they made it sound like it was going to wear out in about 40 years. Well, we got more than 40. And if the Lord doesn't come first, it'll wear out. But it looks from the Bible like it's going to be there when the Lord comes, because all of a sudden it's going to be darkened. Well, I'll tell you what. If we're not connected with God, we don't have any energy. We don't have any power. We don't have any sustenance. And I don't see any umbilical cords from here to heaven. I don't see one single physical connection to heaven anywhere in here or anywhere. I never knew anybody with one. But what I do know is that God has told us that in Christ Jesus, by faith, everyone who wants to be connected with the source of life, the creator, the one who's put all things in it, everything you can't see, he created. Everything you can see, he's created. The source of life. What's the umbilical cord? It's that faith in His love, His power, His mercy. That's why we have sustenance. That's why when we go to a funeral parlor and commend our loved ones to the Lord, we have confidence. Why? Because we believe what Jesus said. We trust the Word of God. We don't, how could that be? Quantum physics is about to solve the problem of how something can come from nothing. But it ain't solved the problem. But the Apostle Paul filled us in and he said by faith. That's the key to all of life. Put your faith in God. It was impossible for death to keep hold on him. This Jesus, he's not just like us, only connected to this earth. He is also the eternal God, invisible in the heavens. He's been there for all eternity. You can drive snails through his hands. You can crown him with thorns. You can hang him from the tree, pierce his side. 
put them in a cave, asphalt the thing down, put stone on there, and put tar around it. And on the third day, he walked out of there again, just as easy as you please, for all eternity. And he said, if you're in me, if you believe in me, if you trust me, if I'm your Savior, the life that I just strolled out of that cave from, it's alive and well in you. Well, God raised him from the dead. He freed him from the agony of death because it was impossible for death to keep hold on him. Exalted to the right hand of God, he has received from the Father the promised Holy Spirit and has poured out on you what you now see and for our purposes, what you now sense in your soul. That's where the source of our life is. We say, take Jesus into your heart. What do we say? What we're really saying is the physical Jesus who sits at the right hand of the Father puts his essential being, his essential soul, essence, soul, puts it in our hearts. Excuse me, and we have that life. We have the lifeline, and it's faith. It's invisible. This world can't provide it. This world can't make that connection. We don't have a ladder long enough to get to heaven. We don't still have an umbilical cord. Remember when they used to go into outer space and, you know, they would uh, fuel in midair, and that, or they do with planes too. When the plane goes flying over top of one and it drops that great big, you know, hose and they link up and they dump all this fuel back into the plane to keep it going well. Ours is spiritual. And that's why it can't be killed. And that's why when this body dies, the spirit lives on for all eternity. And the God who has no problem scooping up a handful of dust and breathing life into it, and all us coming forth from that, has no problem reconstituting our bodies, however long down the road it is when the day of resurrection comes. And those that are lost at sea, those that are buried in the ground, and those that were cremated. When Larry Keyhart died, he was cremated. And Larry said, I want to be three things to happen. I want, number one, in Old Forge, New York, I want a third of my ashes to be thrown out where I water ski. And the second part, he wanted uh, thrown off a bridge somewhere, I don't remember, it was a river somewhere or something. And the third part, Joyce was supposed to do something with. <laughs> and Joyce said to me one day, Rev, I never did with Larry's stuff, his ashes, all the stuff. And you know what I said? If you knew Joyce Keyhart and if you knew Larry, this would make perfect sense. I said, Joyce, Larry run the show. Every hour of every day he was down here. He's gone. You're in charge. You do what you need to do. <laughs> I love them both. He, Jesus is exalted to the right hand of God. He has received from his Father the promised Holy Spirit. It was the promise of God. That's the Abrahamic blessing that all the world will be allowed to embrace. Poured out on what you see and hear. Therefore, let all Israel be assured of this. God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Messiah. When the people heard this, they were cut to the heart. And they said, Peter, official apostle, reputed to be the man at the gate to heaven, most famous of the apostles ever. Peter, may we ask you a question? Yes, what's your question? What do we do in light of what you've just told us? And Peter said this, repent. Turn away from your life down in this world and turn to a savior, Jesus Christ. And let him be the Lord of your life. And stop being so selfish, so self-centered, so narcissistic. Yeah, I know a lot of those narcissistic people. They're terrible to work with. Go look in the mirror. <laughs> we deceive ourselves. Repent. Let Jesus be your Savior, your Lord, your guide, your God. 
every one of you in the name of Jesus for the forgiveness of your sins and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. You will receive. You don't have to jump your hoops. Some people get very emotional. Some people don't. Some people, their lives are transformed in a moment and they go from a life of outrageous sin to a life of discipleship. In a moment's time, and it's traumatic. But a lot of people, they just listen to God every step of the way and when they come to what we call the age of accountability, they say, yes, Lord, I do want you to be my Lord and Savior. They all receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, the forgiveness of sins. Why? Because the promise, the promise of the Father, not my promise, not Peter's promise, the promise of he who keeps and is capable of keeping his promise. The promise is for you, you Jews who are with me right now, what Peter said, and for your children, and for all who are far off. Far away as Hopon, Pennsylvania. As hot, far away as Mayfield, Pennsylvania. As far away as German, Pennsylvania. As far away as Carbondale. As far away as you fill in the blank. I don't care if you're one of those people that is caught in the middle of what's known as Peckville, Einan, and what's the third? Archbald. Where's Peckville, Einan, and Archbald begin and end? I don't know. They're all one lump. <laughs> well, if you're caught over that lump somehow, the Spirit of God is for you. It's the promise of the Father. You're as far off as we are here. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your holy word. Because, Lord, we're just regular people down here. You've got a comprehensive plan. We know it in our hearts. And Jesus Christ executed that plan, completed that plan. His work was certified by you through that resurrection and his apostles are delivering his word to us that we're included in the family of God the lifeline of the spirit of God the umbilical cord the spirit of God that which sustains for eternity that which kept Jesus alive for eternity the spirit Jesus didn't have an umbilical cord. People didn't walk around saying, hey, what's that thing stretching off of Jesus going up into heaven? Well, that's his lifeline to the Father. No, they looked at him and he looked just like us. But the same spirit that sustained him and resurrected him is the promise of the Father to every last one of us. Father, our answer is yes. We want all of that. Bring these things to pass in our life. Be our God. Fill us with your Holy Spirit. Walk with us through this world. Never leave us or forsake us. And we'll worship you for all eternity. Thank you, God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Ladies and gentlemen, let's turn on our hymnals now. 335.
were laying out for us through the lips and the, the Apostle Peter, written and sustained for us in the book of Acts, that you have a comprehensive plan to get us into your family, into your presence, right here and now and for all eternity. Father, please speak to us. We might walk with you here in this world and find out how great it is to walk with you. The world can say what it wants. People can say what they want. People can think what they want. We're walking with you. And that's a source of life and light and hope and power. In Jesus' name we pray.